Welcome back. In the last video, we studied a simplified version of the first problem in finding cross products, which is how do we produce a third vector that is orthogonal to the two inputs of the cross product. In doing so, we produced these three relations. We're now ready to move on. The second problem, let's generalize to vectors x1, y1, z1, and vector y, which is going to be x2, y2, z2. Notice we're going to want to find a measurement of perpendicularity. To create a measurement of perpendicularity, recall the definition of the area of a parallelogram. And we did this definition if we had x1, y1, x2, y2. So in this case, let's delete the third component and then let's just look at an area in the first two components. So let's look at the area of the parallelogram formed by projecting these vector onto the x, y plane. So this is a project vectors onto xy plane. And the moment we project them onto the xy plane, we actually have a pure parallelogram in the exact form that we did earlier from our last video where we were doing the area of the parallelogram. And this area would be, of course, x1 times y2, that's the area of the big uh, rectangle, minus x2 times y1. All right, so we could do the same thing three times over. We got that first one by deleting the z component. Maybe we get the second one by deleting the y component. So we'll call that area perhaps 1, 3, because we're going to delete the second component. And this would come from projecting the vectors in R3 onto the xz plane by just zeroing out the y component. And let's take a look at this. Again, we're going to have an area of a parallelogram. And that area of the parallelogram is going to be the same exact form, y1 times z2 minus, excuse me, x1 times z2 minus x2 times z1. And then we have that last area that we're going to work on here, which would happen when I project the uh, vectors in R3 onto the yz plane. So this is the projection of these vectors x and y. And this would happen when I just literally delete the x com component, right? I would just say delete these two and find the error of the parallelogram in the y and z. And notice there's a pattern here, right? This would be y1, z2 minus y2, z1. And this came from the formula from our last video. All right, now the question is we have three different components and we want to store these components as a vector which we're going to call the cross product between x and y. And the question was where are we going to store each of these components? Okay, well um, we have three choices so there's really three different ways we could do this. We could put this in the x component, the first component, the second component, or third component. Once we choose this, we'll have two choices, so it's the complement of those, and then this will have one choice. However, we might be a little clever and realize that in deleting information, we choose a unique missing component. So here, we've deleted the first uh, x component of each of these vectors. Why don't we store the 
area of the 2, 3 parallelogram in this x component. So we'll actually say that the area of this parallelogram, we're going to go ahead and store in the x component. And what's really interesting about this, remember, this is 2 comma 3. In other words, it's j comma k. When we think about j comma k, j, uh, it's kind of hard to see this, comma k produces a positive i. So we would want this to be in the positive i direction. Okay. So that's the positive i direction. That gets us kind of accounting for this one. Let's look at the next one. To get area 1, 3, I deleted the y component. So I deleted the second one. And remember, when we had i comma k, so this was the i k value, 1, 3, that area was in the negative j direction. So this is x1 times z2 minus x2 times z1. And we just said that if we're going to use that orientation, that should be negative j. And then we're left with one more, which comes from deleting the x values. That's this one, right? Excuse me, deleting the z values. So this would be x comma y. And now the cross products in the positive k direction. So we write x1, y2 minus x2, y1. And this is now in the positive k direction. This is a vector sum. But this vector sum happens uh, with respect to these components. So I can actually write this individually. The i component stays the same. This is y1, z2, minus y2, z1. This is going to be the first component of my cross product. I can already see that I'm going to run out of room here. So I'm going to go ahead and write this in a non-standard way. I would recommend that you be a little bit more prudent about um, budgeting room in your notes. Here, we're going to write this in the second component of a cross product. But notice we need a negative factor because i cross k goes in the negative j direction. Right, i cross k goes in negative j. So I'm going to factor in that negative factor to start with. So this, instead of x1, z2 minus x2, z1, this would be x2, z1, negative times a negative is a positive, minus x1, z2. So it's literally the exact same area, just flipped in reverse because of the um, agreement that we made about how to orient the cross product. And then finally, we have this one in the positive k direction. So this is literally just going to be x1, y2 minus x2, y1. So this is what we said was the x comp or first component of cross product, which came from canceling out the x component of each of them and then finding the area of the parallelogram in the yz plane. So here's the first component. Here's the second component of the cross product. Same thing. We cancel out the y component of the original vectors and then find the area. In this case, we multiply by a negative 1 by the convention that i cross k is equal to a negative j. And then finally, the third component here is given by this. And then I'm going to see if I can write this a little bit smaller. I'm going to break my own cardinal rule. I'm going to use a different pen, actually. So this implies that x cross y I can write as the following vector. It is y1 times z2 minus y2 times z1. Here, we cancel out the x to get the one in the x value. So this one, we would cancel out the y. It would be x1, z2 minus x2, z1. But remember, we flip it. So this must be x2, 
z1 minus x1 z2, and that was just because i cross k is negative j, not positive j. And then finally, the same pattern holds. To get the one in the third component, I delete the z's, and I'm left with x's, so this would be x1, y2, x's and y's, and this again would be x2 minus y1. Okay, that is now the definition of the component form of the cross product. In the next video, we'll actually uh, calculate this. This definition also corresponds with the exact intuition that we developed earlier in this video, which was this. We'll, we can confirm this if you'd like. Uh, we said that i cross j was going to be equal to a positive k. We said that i cross k was going to be equal to a negative j. And then we said that j cross k should be equal to a positive i. Right? Um, and then we said that the other thing that we said was that if we switch the order of these, j cross i, we should get the orthogonal vector in the opposite direction. So this means that k cross i would be equal to positive j. And then this also means that k cross j should be a negative i. So the, these relations hold with this component form. In the next video, let's take a look at some examples of how to calculate this cross product quickly. And then we'll move on to algebraic properties and eventually geometric properties, which is the cousin of the cosine formula for the dot product will be known as the sine formula for the cross product. Are you ready for some signs in Math 1C? All right, see you there.